Welcome to our lecture on Madame de Stahl. She's a fascinating personality and one of these figures where um, we're dealing with this transition between Enlightenment and Romanticism. Rousseau was the one we, we first uh, had this encounter between subjectivities, between a, a sense of self that it would seem very different. The Enlightenment with um, transparency of self, of a well, where, where everything is, is lit up rightly. And then the romantic self, which is so stormy and full of dark corners. Rousseau has to uh, try to negotiate within himself these, these different polar this polarity. Uh, Kant, taking up Rousseau, is another figure, even though him, his own life seems very calm. He didn't have the same kind of drama and melodrama that Rousseau uh, experience. And yet Kant's philosophy shifts the philosophical world decisively into the romantic mode. Uh, Madame de Stahl is another figure here. Before we get to the last um, person in the semester, Lord Byron, who's squarely in the romantic camp. Uh, Madame de Stahl, Germain de Stahl, is also um, picks up from a figure we saw last semester, Christine de Pizan, the, the first real uh, woman of letters who was able to make a living off of that uh, because she was given a very strong education by her father. Uh, Madame de Stahl was given a very good education by her parents. Her mother saw to it that she was uh, given uh, the, the, the most um, important advantages that you could uh, receive in terms of the, the authors of the day. And so she is well positioned to take, it, uh, take hold of the opportunity that was given to her by being born into a family of great prominence. Her father, Jacques Necker, was the, basically the finance minister for the king of France. He had begun that position in uh, 1777 and so this is during the time of the Revolutionary War in America. So that's the other thing we can really put on the table with this lecture, the two revolutions. Uh, this cycle, this semester we've been talking about reform and enlightenment. Well, the other theme is, and the thing that, that gets more and more traction as we go into next semester, is revolution. Enlightenment has two great monuments right in terms of history you've got the american revolution which puts republicanism that is a non-monarchical form of government really into um, the large scale uh, realization the largest scale realization up to the uh, scene up to that point and we have the french revolution which would have more influence in the imagination of europe especially than Amer the American Revolution. So throughout the 1800s, we're going to see revolutions pop up and they're going to take as their model, not the American, but the French. And that, that will go on into the, the, uh, the Marxist revolutions too, where violence, internal violence, becomes such an important hallmark of, of change. As we know from history, um, in 1778, there's the alliance with America. France gets involved partly as a proxy war uh, with Britain because they've been going through the Second Hundred Years' War, basically. You have the, the Seven Years' War that ends in 1763. France's alliance with America, which was so essential for American independence, it, it, we could not have um, succeeded without that alliance. Well, it, it bankrupts I mean, uh, France. France had been suffering uh, financial distress since 1720, at least. And this was the thing that put it over the top. Now, Necker, uh, Madame de Stahl's father, was managing it pretty well. In 1781, he published um, the French budget. He was very good at um, squeezing uh, corruption out of the system and, and saving money that way. And he eliminated sinecures, for instance. But there was still this huge debt that he, was, he had a, a, the ability to mask. He was able to 
save money, enough money to service the debt, so it wasn't immediately uh, problematic. So the people of France saw this budget and said, well, this, this guy's a genius. It, it looks pretty good. And when the, uh, the war continued, right, the Peace of Paris doesn't happen until 1783, uh, the finances get worse and worse. There's a famine in uh, 1788, and so all of this leads up to the great events, momentous events of 1789, which we'll look at in a, in a bit. So, as the daughter of the, a man who is so influential in the life of France, uh, a man who, by the way, comes from Geneva, so he's a Protestant, he's a, he's a Cal he was raised a Calvinist, and so he couldn't be uh, fully admitted into the, the king's council. He couldn't um, have all of the privileges that, that belong only to uh, a Catholic in, in France at that time. So, uh, and, but now the, so he's an outsider, and he's, he's a clever man. He's, he's not, he wasn't born to nobility. He, he rose up uh, through financial acumen. But having risen to the upper spheres of, of French life, uh, that allowed the young Germain de Stahl to uh, Germain Necker to to grow up in a salon um, of great brilliance. So Germain's mother had one of the most splendid salons in, in Paris. And so at a very young age, Germain was exposed to great personalities and the, 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 the pleasure of conversation and of the adventure of ideas. She just, she loved that. And as a little girl, she was, this was um, her formation. And, and that was always in her bones, actually. This was something she would carry throughout her life, this passion for conversation. And of course, she got the attention of, of everyone doted on her and that, that would have been uh, important for the formation of her personality too. So she is raised in this enlightenment salon, just like the philosophes uh, in general, they, they would have engaged in a lot of their, the advancement of their ideas, the more progressive ideas would have come up in these kinds of settings. Uh, Madame Necker had one of the great, um, one of these great uh, enlightenment uh, dynamos here. So that is Germaine's background. But as she gets older, she's raised reading Rousseau. That was one of the things her mother exposed her to. She's she's very taken with this this writer. So you see that that, that that's going to get her moving. And eventually she in fact, even though it's Friedrich Schlegel who coins the term romanticism, it is Madame de Stahl, who popularizes the term. So that's important to know that she's the one who actually gives us the name of the period that follows the Enlightenment. The only thing that sets her apart from the Romantics, well, the most decisive thing that does, is that she was a committed opponent of Napoleon. And as we'll see with Byron, um, what excited so many uh, romantics, what really got them going, it got their, uh, their deepest hopes aroused, was Napoleon. Now, that, that's something that, that gets problematic, of course, as Napoleon's career proceeds, but Madame de Stahl was always an opponent. She was a political liberal. That is, she wanted equality for the law. She wanted accountable government. And what she saw, of course, is Napoleon is a monarch. He's an authoritarian. And so she had the uh, consistency to want to say, well, even if he's unleashing forces of egalitarianism, in some sense, he is himself authoritarian. One of her lovers, Benjamin Constant, was, is one of the great liberal political philosophers, and uh, they, they actually were intellectual partners for, for a long time. And so that, that puts us um, in the, the atmosphere here where she's an anti-Napoleonic liberal. She's between enlightenment and romanticism. 
And she gives us in her writing, so she is a woman of letters. She's, she writes novels. She writes uh, literary criticism. She writes political philosophy. And she's grappling with her emotions as having some kind of political salience. So in the selections we have, that's what's put before us. And we can ask the question, do one's emotions have any political significance? That's something she's, she's trying to, to think about. We, we've had the classical conversation about, with Plato, for instance, the soul and the city being um, um, analogous to each other. But here with the, uh, the movement into the Romantic era, we've got this new question. How do our emotions have our passions uh, relate to the political order. And that's something uh, Madame de Stahl puts before. She has a, a great effect uh, in general. She, she, while Napoleon was, was invading Russia, she was actually kind of paralleling uh, that journey uh, east. And she became, she was a confidant of so many important men. General Kutuzov, who's so important in, in uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace, was writing her letters around the time of the Battle of Peretino. Uh Emerson, the great American transcendentalist, uh, cites her, and it, it, the transmission of, say, continental thought, German thought, uh, is to Emerson is sometimes mediated by Madame de Stahl. All right. She marries, she gets the name from uh, a, this of her man who becomes the Swedish ambassador to France, uh, Eric de Salle. And that, that marriage happens in 1786. She, it's a marriage of convenience, and she ends up having many lovers, including the first one being Bishop Talleyrand, a very interesting figure, because he's, he's the foreign minister basically under, both the ancien, uh, under the Ancien Regime, the monarchy, during the Revolution, during uh, Napoleon's uh, imperial period and after the restoration. I mean, he's, a, he's the very definition of a survivor and uh, knew Madame de Salle intimately. She publishes uh, letters on Rousseau in 1788, this very important figure in her own uh, formation. And then of course that leads us to the events of, of the revolution. In 1789, because of the great financial crisis um, the king, Louis the Sixteenth has to call the Estates General for the first time in centuries to try to get some way to deal with looming bankruptcy. Eventually, well, the, the great debate, and Necker, uh, Germain's father, takes a side here. He says, um, when the third estate, so we have the first estate being the clergy, the second estate being the aristocracy, and those two, um, of course, constitute maybe 5% of the population. And then the rest of the common people of um, France make up the third estate. The voting of the Estates General had always gone by order. That is, you have one vote for each of the estates. So the clergy and the nobles could always block any initiative from the masses. There were more representatives um, in the third estate coming to this assembly, and they demanded to have votes by head instead of by order. Necker uh, supported that move. So eventually, the king it locks the, the third estate out of the, their meeting hall. They go over, this is in Versailles, they go over to an indoor tennis court and they take this tennis court oath, and that's very important because that, that leads to the uh, events which transforms, transforms the Estates General into the National Assembly. Eventually, the king acquiesces to the fact that there's going to be voting in the Estates General by head and not by order, and that's that we have now a different kind of legislative body, a, a constitutional body, a National Assembly. Uh, the storming of the Bastille happens in July, of course, and then you've got the, this quintessential Enlightenment document, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. Uh, all during this period, uh, Necker has been recalled to be the finance minister, 
the king dismisses him uh, at right before the storming of the Bastille, and that is one of the events that excites the crowd to 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 take this revolutionary action. Once the people take over, they they call Germain's father back into service, and that lasts for another year. But of course, the the um, the mood of the mob changes very uh, swiftly and drastically over these these action-packed years. In 1791, you have a new constitution, or a constitution for the first time, a written constitution that creates a constitutional monarchy. That's what the, um, the important forces of the Third Estate were mostly of the middle classes. They were the rising bourgeoisie. And they didn't want a radical democracy. They wanted, uh, they wanted reform. And so you have now a, a king, Louis XVI, who is, who is bound by a constitution, like in England. So that's the constitutional monarchy. It gets difficult because now the other heads of European states are looking at the situation in France and they're, they are not happy. They're, they're frightened, actually. So Austria and Prussia in particular, they threaten, they threaten the people of France uh, if, they, if, if anything happens to the monarch, uh, there will be swift vengeance visited upon the people of France. Well, that, that causes a great reaction. And that, that's part of the, the story here of the French Revolution, that a lot of the uh, radical uh, violence of the revolution is, an, is a reaction to outside what is seen as an existential threat to, to French existence. So maybe if the uh, Ancien Regime and other nations had been more moderate, you would have had a different result. In any case, the sans culotte, the uh, the people who did not wear the knee uh, breeches, the, the 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 fashionable silk pants that the aristocratic, uh, the the silk cutoffs that that the aristocratic folk wore, they they wore full pants. That that was one of the marks of a, a lower class person. A, a mob of them attacked the. T- Tuileries Palace in Paris, and um, so that's that's great violence that is suddenly being uh, realized in in Paris. The French army has a great victory, important uh, symbolic victory at Valmy against the Prussians, and this all in the end results in a republic, right? That is no longer is the king in charge. We have the the root meaning of republic is not having a, a one person rule at this point the national assembly becomes the national convention okay the next year louis the 16th is executed uh a levé en masse is is raised that is a conscription of men between 18 and 25 over a million men now make up the french army and they are set because all of the forces of europe are are um coming at this revolutionary government, which has now done a thing that is shocking, truly shocking in the eyes of, of Europe, the, the execution of the king. All right, so in the end, you have Napoleon doing his coup d'etat in 1799. He will crown himself emperor in 1804. It is during this, this time of extreme drama that uh, Madame de Stahl is writing First, the first of our selections comes from the influence of the passions on the happiness of individuals and nations in 1796. Uh, you have the Reign of Terror. I forgot to mention that. The Reign of Terror st- starts off here in 93, uh, and it, it burns itself out within a year, but thousands of people are executed by guillotine here. So that's uh, that, that Reign of Terror has already happened by the time she writes this work, and she's thinking about all of this in the midst of, of the, um, the drama. There's the Thermidorian reaction that, that ends the, the terror, but then there's another form of terror and so on. It goes on and on until Napoleon takes advantage of this. People are exhausted by all of this violence. And yet, uh, so he reimposes, and this is, this is the very, and we'll talk about it more with the le- next lecture, what is so paradoxical about Napoleon is he says he's the revolution on horseback, right? He claims those ideals, and yet he's the one who destroys republicanism. And, he, he is the one-man rule, and, and far more absolute even than Louis XVI was. Uh, as an opponent of Napoleon, Madame de Stahl is writing using her, her great gifts as a writer to 
um, to, to do uh, to uh, resist this this kind of eclipse of liberty, and she's she's exiled eventually. She travels around Europe. He, she engages the great thinker August Schlegel to tutor uh, her children. She sets up in Switzerland across, uh, on Lake Geneva at Chateau Coppet. And Stendhal called this place the Estates General of European Opinion. And so that it was another, like her mother's uh, salon, this was a just a brilliant gathering place. And to connect with the next lecture, Byron was a, a frequent guest. Just if you had, um, if you were anybody and you, and you wanted to talk, you wanted to converse, you wanted to have a great conversation, you would go to Chateau Copet. And uh, that's, that's where... Um, she spent time, but then she continued to travel, and she would, and she would have all of these experiences and reflect upon them, and that she would help forge this new sensibility that we we all kind of um, live with now. And but she's thinking about it in relation to these political questions, which makes her such a fascinating figure. In 1802, she writes a very popular novel called Delphine, and we have a, a very telling a few selections from that novel in in this week's reading. So that's that's something that's gonna be very fun to um, to think through because it, it, one of the funny things she does is that she, she creates this character, uh, this woman who's actually basically uh, Bishop Talleyrand in drag. So that's, that's kind of amusing. So with Madame de Stahl, we have a, a woman of immense intelligence who comes from the, the heights of the Ancien Regime in her mother's Enlightenment Salon and travels this, this long journey to where we are today, basically, this, this kind of romantic, liberal, in the, the, uh, the old sense of the word, um, sense of self as owed, a, a form of government that that treats everyone equally, that gives, um, that is accountable to the people, and also has to, and wants to, think about that new kind of common existence in terms of the new feelings we're feeling, a door that, that Rousseau really kind of opened up for all of us. So how do we have a, a, a common order under democratic republican conditions and an ever deepening sense of individuality and of this kind of um, well we would assume radically unique experience that is rooting, rooted in our emotions madame de Stahl is a great guide uh, it just a just a magnificent kind of thinker of these um, great paradoxes that still define who we are today.